Coming up on your horizon. Well, probably no single event has shaped our state as much as the Dust Bowl. Forced off the land by environmental forces and economic collapse, thousands of poor Oklahoma families fled westward, but others stayed. Today, we'll look at the lessons we can learn from both. <laughs> there wasn't any crops. That, that was a bad year, and I think that was the year that Grandpa and Daddy put their cotton together, and it made one bale. And while adversity can be a harsh but an effective teacher, the lessons learned from prosperity are often much more subtle. We'll begin today by looking at what many are called a tipping point in our nation's energy future. Stay with us for Oklahoma Horizon, and I will explain. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education. Oklahoma's investment in career tech provides more than nationally recognized technology education and training. It produces solid financial returns for the state's economic future. Oklahoma Career Tech, elevating our economy. And the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping good people grow good things. And now, from the Career Tech Studios in Stillwater, here's your host, Rob McClendon. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us here on Horizon. Well, in the time you spend watching this, the device you're using will have sucked up several watts of electricity. Electricity that at one time was almost exclusively produced by burning slivers of coal, but increasingly is being generated today by using natural gas or renewables like wind and solar. Yet despite these improvements and the fact that many of us drive more fuel efficient vehicles, we still use nearly twice as much petroleum as we did in 1960, and the majority of it is imported. Energy and our national security remain a perpetual hot button subject on the campaign trail and one that the candidates often manipulate for their own benefit. So today, we begin by facing the facts on U.S. energy. Here's Frank Cessna. Energy, it's one of those things that's as emotional as it is necessary. It's built a great nation, a superpower, given us the freedom to move. Americans put a premium on energy. We buy it around the world, even from countries we don't especially like. We've debated this for years. Jobs versus environment, renewables versus fossil fuels, cost versus carbon. And when accidents happen, they can be disastrous, reminding us we're still human. But we need this stuff. And nearly 40 years after an Arab oil embargo shocked the country, the U.S. still imports well over half its oil, less than it used to, but still more than half of every barrel. With amazing new drilling technologies, they're finding oil now in places like North Dakota. Yes, North Dakota. And vast tracts offshore may hold a lot more. Our appetites extend well beyond gasoline, of course. Electricity demand today is more than 13 times what it was in 1950. Think of all those smartphones and computers we recharge every day. There is good news, though. When it comes to miles per gallon, 40 is the new 30. National electricity consumption has flattened in recent years, thanks in part to conservation, technology, green building. A record 13% of America's electricity comes from renewables and cheaper, cleaner natural gas, fracking questions and all, is replacing coal and in abundant supply. Even with a greener vision, the thirst for energy will continue because there's continued growth and more people. Balancing the energy we need with the planet we want will require choices, trade-offs. They should be fueled by facts. And while energy policy is a big election year talking point, it might surprise you that while renewable energy alternatives may generate interest and enthusiasm, comparatively, they create very few jobs. Just 138,000 jobs are generated from around the country from alternative energy like biofuels and wind. Still, more than the 75,000 jobs that are generated by the nuclear industry, but way shy of the 1.3 million people who are employed by either mining for coal or drilling for oil and natural gas. When we return, a tipping point in our nation's energy future. You're watching Oklahoma Horizon, featuring some of the good things that are happening in the great state of Oklahoma. 
Well, since mid-2009, more than 1,100 new oil rigs have begun pumping in the United States, about one new rig per day. And while domestic oil production has reached its highest point since 2003, it is still less than one-third of the oil consumed by Americans, if you will. Take a look at this with me. Each day here in the U.S., we consume right at 20 million barrels of oil. Now, of that, almost 6 million barrels are domestically produced oil. And while U.S. oil production is at its highest point since 2003, we still import all the rest of this oil. Now, granted, some of it is from friendly nations like Canada and Mexico here in North America. But the rest of our oil imports, well, they come from abroad from nations we often have uneasy alliances with. But when it comes to natural gas, the news is much better. For the first time, we're using as much natural gas as coal to generate American electricity. Natural gas prices now rival that of coal, having fallen thanks to our abundant American supplies. Yet despite this dramatic rise in natural gas for electricity production, when it comes to transportation, it's another story. 93% of American transportation still depends on petroleum. In fact, transportation is more oil reliant than any other U.S. economic sector on foreign oil. Now, 71% of our country's entire oil supply, both domestic and imported, now goes to power various types of cars and trucks that we all depend upon. Here's more from our friends at Face the Facts USA. We're number one, as in the U.S. transportation system is the largest in the world, and our highway vehicles, airplanes, boats, and rail gobble up 13.6 million barrels of oil per day. In just four days, that's enough barrels to circle the globe. With 93% of our planes, trains, and automobiles fueled by oil, the U.S. transportation system is almost completely dependent on petroleum. But this heavy reliance on petroleum has its side effects. The CO2 emissions from American transportation alone were higher than the total emissions from all sources of any other nation except China. Now that's a lot of gas. Greenhouse gas emissions from transportation have increased by about 19% since 1990. This historical increase is largely due to increased demand for travel, rising income, and the stagnation of fuel-efficient vehicles. As Americans continue to travel, whether across town or around the world, they'll leave their mark on one thing for sure, the environment. Explore more at facethefactsusa.org. But our country's dependence on foreign oil could soon lessen if the efforts of some prominent Oklahomans prove successful. It takes a lot of fuel to keep the big wheels rolling on long haul trucks, and it's not cheap, which is why filling up this semi with compressed natural gas is such a big deal. This is great for the state of Oklahoma because this truly is a game changer moment for our state. Governor Mary Fallon, along with other state officials, gathered at this Love's Travel Stop Morning, to mark the opening of the company's first fast fuel station that will enable heavy duty trucks to fill her up on natural gas. This particular truck here that is being fueled with CNG, their fuel cost will be half of what it's going to be if you were to be putting in diesel into powering this vehicle. So that's a great savings for businesses. It's a great savings for our state when we utilize state CNG vehicles. And it truly is a game changer moment. It's starting right here in Oklahoma. But it's a game that could be a long one. The changeover to compressed natural gas has been slow. Yet CNG proponents like Tom Love say if America could affordably manufacture natural gas trucks and then build enough fueling stations to keep them on the road, the economy could shave billions of dollars a year off our imported fuel bill. It would seem to be a no-brainer, wouldn't it? It would be a lot more simple to build the refueling infrastructure for the heavy truck industry than it would be for cars. That's because a typical semi-trailer truck can guzzle 20,000 gallons of diesel annually, which is the equivalent fuel use of 40 cars. And by focusing on long-haul trucks, it doesn't require building nearly as many new fueling stations as switching America's roughly 240 million cars and light trucks to something other than oil. For CNG, for compressed natural gas, uh, uh, you can't deliver it to the station in a truck like this. It's got to be, it's got to come in via natural gas pipeline. 
but the overall cost at the end of the day, it's begin, beginning to look like it's going to be about 50% cost savings, which is big, you know, which is huge. But ultimately, the true success of compressed natural gas may just come down to numbers. Today, premium leaded is at $3.75, diesel at $3.94, but compressed natural gas, it's $1.89. Which could turn into a significant savings for taxpayers. 22 governors have put their combined support behind a bipartisan initiative to encourage automakers to invest and develop more alternative fuel vehicles. To purchase the CNG cars and trucks for themselves. Speaking to energy executives at the Cox Convention Center, Governor Fallon unveiled a plan to convert cars and trucks in state vehicle fleets to compress natural gas. By being able to issue a large purchasing agreement with various states to transition our state cars or state fleets used by government to CNG vehicles will help encourage infrastructure like Love's Country Stores being able to put in quick fuel stations for CNG compressed natural gas which does many things. First of all it helps our commercial trucking industry which is a large consumer of diesel and certainly gasoline throughout our nation. It helps with our environment because it helps provide a cleaner form of energy into the environment, which helps us with clean air attainment as it relates to the federal government and the EPA itself. And of course, for our state cars that we use converting to CNG, it will also help save taxpayers money. Creating a demand that will hopefully solve what has been a chicken or egg dilemma. Which comes first, demand for CNG vehicles or the infrastructure to support them? But like most roads, too, in alternative energy future, this one does have its own share of potholes. Trucks configured to burn natural gas cost more than trucks that run on diesel. And for years, environmentalists have lobbied for taxpayer subsidies for natural gas cars and trucks, arguing that the domestic fuel burns cleaner than gasoline or diesel. Meanwhile, Oklahoma oilman T. Boone Pickens also has made his own push for Washington to get behind a subsidized shift into CNG. But so far, both groups have been largely unsuccessful, despite the fact that recent discoveries from Pennsylvania all the way down to Texas means our country is literally awash in this domestic fuel. So it may well be up to the 22 state coalition that Governor Fallon has spearheaded for CNG to find its way into our fuel tanks. Now, if you'd like to learn more about CNG's potential impact on our economy, just head to OKHorizon.com and click on our value added section of the website where I sit down with Mr. Pickens to talk about his energy plan. Still to come on Oklahoma Horizon, the dirty 30s and the indelible mark the Dust Bowl left on our state. But first, the economics of an environmental disaster. Move or starve. Those were the words one migrant chose to describe his options in Oklahoma during the Dust Bowl. Between 1935 and 1940, over 300,000 Oklahomans, a third of our population at that time, moved out of state in search of work. Those who left faced the hardships of the Great Depression, and those who stayed, well, they choked on clouds of dust. It's an often told tale here in Oklahoma, and one that's going to be revisited this month by award-winning filmmaker Ken Burns in a much-anticipated PBS documentary. And I'll never forget my grandmother. She said, you kids run and get together. The end of the world's coming. A familiar story here in Oklahoma, yet one that goes well beyond bad weather and speaks to changing economic realities that we can still learn from today. As the first tanks rolled through Europe during the First World War, America's farmers were plowing the plains. Demand for U.S. wheat had never been higher. When America entered the conflict, Washington urged farmers to produce even more with the slogan, food will win the war. Then we reaped the golden harvest. Then we really plowed the plains. Prices more than doubled, and farmers flocked to fields hoping to cash in. But the demand was a bubble that would burst. After the war, prices plunged, and farmers, armed with tractors, 
responded to falling prices by planning more, hoping increased volume could offset decreasing prices. We had the manpower. We invented new machinery. The world was our market. Over five million new acres were planted in the 1920s by farmers hoping to survive the downturn. But it wasn't to be. When the stock market crashed in 1929, America's heartland was already in trouble. A drought was just beginning. Banks began to close, and equipment lay idle in the field. And then the winds began to blow. A country without rivers, without streams, with little rain. Left little cover for tilled ground, and dust storms began to blow. By the end of 1931, a survey showed of the 16 million acres of land cultivated in Oklahoma, 13 million was severely eroded, and our state was to face a test like no other. Oklahoma Horizon is now portable. Just subscribe to our weekly podcast. Visit iTunes.com where you can download our show for your listening or viewing convenience. Well, like many Oklahomans, the story of the Dust Bowl is the story of my family. I grew up hearing of the hardships and a sky the color of copper. But most of all, I learned from my parents' stories the value of resilience in the face of overwhelming odds. I've never seen anything as dark in my life as that was. It was a day my mother will always remember. We were all at church on one Sunday uh, night. A man came in from outside and told us there was a bad cloud coming up. And we better uh, get home while we could. Black Sunday, April 14th, 1935. Oh, it was so dark, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. And I, Daddy told me to hold his belt in the back, you know. He, he was going to lead us all home. So we were all lined up and holding on to each other. We were at the yard fence before we could see the light in the window. And when, when Daddy saw the light, well, he said, oh, well, he, Mama's got, the, I got a light on, so we're, we're all right now. Before it was done, Black Sunday left a coating of Oklahoma topsoil on ships in New York Harbor, one of the worst sandstorms of the dirty 30s, but certainly not the only one. It's estimated over the course of the decade, an area 500 miles long by 300 miles wide lost its topsoil. Because it would blow in the window, blow in even though you had the windows closed, you know, and the doors closed, it would still blow around them and get all over your house. You could leave your tracks in the floor. If you had a uh, sandstorm one day, you got it cleaned up, you know, and got the house cleaned up, well, you probably wouldn't have wanted to get it cleaned up and here'd be another one. And while people shut themselves indoors, plants and animals weren't so fortunate. What did that do to crops? What did it do to your family's farm? <laughs> there wasn't any crops. That, that was a bad year, and I think that was the year that Grandpa and Daddy put their cotton together, and it made one bale from both farms, Grandpa's farm and ours. And of course, the, it, it affected the feed crops, too, that fed the animals. And while times were tough for farmers that owned their own land, they were even harder for the 60% of farmers that rented. Called sharecroppers, they were already on the edge of poverty. And when the black blizzards blew in, they lost not just their crops, but their way of life. Beginning a mass migration that literally changed the face of our state. This is Wreck, Oklahoma, or at least what was Wreck, Oklahoma, a small farming community that my father was born in. And like dozens of other agrarian communities, when the crops dried up, so did the town, sending thousands onto the roads looking for work. I can't even remember when I wasn't working in the fields, really, because I was so young, I don't even remember it. 
For my father's family, the Dust Bowl was just the final straw that broke their economic back. During the 1930s, the federal government paid farmers to take land out of production in an effort to raise the price of cotton. And with no need for sharecropper labor, families like my father's found themselves homeless. I remember when we made uh, cornbread out of bran that we had for the horses that, uh, to feed them, you know, because my uncle bought the feed for the horses, and so we used it to make cornbread out of several times, you know. And uh, lots of times, hey, as it has been times in my life, it, hey, we just didn't have nothing to eat hardly, you know. You just cinch up your belt a little bit and dream of better days, really. Hitting the road, my father's family was one of over 300,000 Oklahomans that left the state in the 1930s in search of new opportunities. With few available, his family struggled, living behind a road sign, even spending a winter in a tent. School became a luxury and shoes a rarity. Didn't have shoes to wear when barefoot started school barefoot, really, you know. Didn't think nothing about it. Well, you thought something about it, but hey, what could you do about it? Oki soon became a derogatory word and discrimination became all too common. But determined to endure, families like my father's suffered through the indignations, often with humility and sometimes with defiance. Well, you had to use a little muscle sometimes, you know, and they knew it, and so they left you alone. Creating a character that survives even today. Well, times did get better. Federal programs put people to work and new environmental practices were implemented to keep the land in place. But it really took a war to break the grip of the Great Depression as farm laborers left the fields for the factory. Well, while many of the lessons learned during the darkest days of the Depression still guide our lives today, there was a time in Oklahoma many in the state just wanted to forget. With more, here's our Andy Barnes. Well, with dirt blown across the nation and countless families left with nothing, the Dust Bowl certainly left its mark on America. Images that today are largely drawn from two places, a famous book, The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck, and the government-funded documentary, The Plow That Broke the Plains. And while we may appreciate this captured piece of history, there was a time when Oklahomans saw both pieces of work as black marks on the state. The Joves were merely characters in a book, but this fictional family caused a hostility that was very real in the hearts of many Oklahomans. Jennifer Collins is an Oklahoma historian. Congressman Lyle Boren actually gave a speech against it in the U.S. House. Um, he said it was a black infernal creation of a twisted, distorted mind. But not everyone shared the congressman's views. Pulitzer Prize winning reporter and author of the bestseller The Worst Hard Times, Timothy so Egan says, there is a bigger story. Didn't everyone leave? No. It turns out everyone did not leave. It turns out two-thirds of the people living in the epicenter of the Dust Bowl stayed behind. A decision most people back then mocked them for. A lot of people said at the time that they were stupid, they were ignorant, uh, they blasted them, they criticized them, they made fun of their ancestry. I think it was a couple of things. They really, they'd heard from other people that leaving, going to California, you couldn't do well. Also, they had something. They had a piece of dirt, which they'd never had before. And they also, they thought it was going to end. They thought, this can't possibly go on. But contrary to what really happened, the story The Grapes of Wrath made quite an impact on the nation. It took more than 40 years for the rest of America to think of Oklahoma as anything but dry and dusty, a stereotype Oklahomans were not pleased with. And Collins says the book's author, John Steinbeck, was baffled by the negative reaction. He said he didn't understand the criticism that he saw in the Jodes, um, a beautiful people, a strong and resilient people, and he never intended the book as a smear on the state. But despite good intentions, Oklahoma was labeled as a windy desert. Now, amidst the tragedy and hard times, Oklahomans made the best of it. To try and break the stereotype that Oklahoma was nothing but blowing dirt, the University of Oklahoma put its focus on football. They wanted to prove that Oklahoma was still strong. Earl Deacon, who was an OU regent, said, quote, Men, there is only one way to get the state back on track, and that's football, football, football. Thank you, Andy. 
Now the story of the survivors of the dust storms that terrorized America's high plains is told in the award-winning book, The Worst Hard Times. And I was able to sit down with its Pulitzer Prize winning author, Timothy Egan, to see that interview and much more. Just head to our website at okhorizon.com and go to our value added section. They have served proudly and are headed home. Next time on Oklahoma Horizon, helping those who have served. He's got to understand and feel good about his own future and what he's going to do. And for a lot of Oklahoma veterans, uh, that's, an uncertain, that's an uncertain period. But a lot of these young men and women uh, uh, you know, need that education and need the security that comes with, uh, with uh, finding themselves in a new profession. On Oklahoma Show for the Heartland, Oklahoma Horizon. Well, looks like we are out of time. I'm Rob McClendon. Thanks for watching. See you back here next week. Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping good people grow good things.